Hello and welcome to India Speak, the podcast by the Center for Policy Research. I'm Sushant Singh, Senior Fellow at Center for Policy Research. This series of podcasts features leading global experts and academics on the many facets of Sino-India relations. Some of them, like Professor Taylor Frevel, have looked at the strategic side of things, while others have focused on the military facets. But today, we will be discussing the historical and political aspects, looking at China and its relationship with India through that unique lens. And to do that, our guest today is one of the top academics studying modern China. Rana Mitter is the Professor of History and Politics of Modern China at the University of Oxford. He works on the emergence of nationalism in modern China, both in the early 20th century and in the present era. He has published on the political and cultural history of 20th century China and is currently working on the connections between war and nationalism in China from the 1930s to the present. He is the author of several well-acclaimed books, his latest one being China's Good War, How World War II is Shaping a New Nationalism. His new book, Chinese Characters, A BBC History of China in 20 Lives, is expected soon. Rana, welcome to India Speak. Sushant, it's a great pleasure to be here and thanks so much for the opportunity to talk to you. Rana, let me begin with uh, something that you believe in and have stated very explicitly, that to help us understand the new China, we must look at its past. Can you tell our listeners as to what really does the past tell us about new China, especially when we look at it from an Indian perspective, from a perspective here in New Delhi? Absolutely. Well, I have to say, in, in service of that idea that looking at the past is essential for understanding the present, I wouldn't just cite my own authority, which may not be very great. I would cite actually the fact that when you look at most of China's top leaders when they travel around the world, Xi Jinping, Wang Yi, whoever it might be, quite often they will cite some aspect of Chinese history as a means of justifying or explaining some aspect of China's contemporary policy. So you can agree or disagree with any particular policy, and I'm sure many of us have, have quite varied views on these things. But in terms of understanding where the Chinese side are coming from, a study of both ancient and modern history of China is a really useful thing to have in the, uh, in the toolkit. So let's just give a quick example to try and back up the argument that understanding the past does does matter. One of the things that um, I think is notable, uh, and I think this is not a particularly controversial thing to, to say, is that China does tend to be very, very defensive in the way that it talks about its own interests and borders in the wider world. And if you look at the way in which the Chinese themselves talk about why they feel this way, because they're very self-aware about it, it's, it's not a surprise or a secret to, to them, the long history of invasion and occupation during the modern era is central to that. My own particular research has concentrated on China's experience during the Second World War. And while I won't on this occasion perhaps go into full detail about all aspects of that, I can say that the experience of being invaded and occupied by Japan in the 1930s and 1940s, even though it's you know three quarters of a century ago, more than that really, still shapes the way that many, many Chinese policymakers and thinkers think about the vulnerabilities of their own society. Objectively, of course, China is the second biggest economy in the world, second biggest military in the world. It's not really vulnerable in the sense in which most of us would understand that term, but its past history shapes a mindset that makes people think, well, maybe we could be invaded again one day, maybe someone might attack us, and that's why we have to do certain things that the rest of the world doesn't always understand. That will be the Beijing point of view anyway. Uh, Rana, are you saying that uh, this has created some insecurities in the Chinese decision makers' mind, policy makers' mind? Or the more cynical view would be, you know, that this is just an additive that they're projected to project a certain face to the world, such as that they do not attack anyone. Every time they do a military action, it is only a counterattack that has been done. Uh, which of the two would be more true? Or is it a combination of both? I think it's not possible to separate the two things as being either or, because they both play an element. I mean, first of all, you're quite right that there are certain rhetorical uh, phrases and tropes that China uses over and over again as a means of avoiding conversation rather than necessarily taking it head on. So the idea that China has never invaded any other country might come as a surprise to the South Koreans in 1950 or indeed the Vietnamese in 1979, both of whom have somewhat different views on that, that question. But, you know, we know that other countries, you know, the United States has invaded Iraq and there are other examples too. The point is not that China is uniquely good or bad. The point is that China in some ways is quite comparable with other places. And China's argument 
wants to be that actually no China is different and actually saying well you know in many ways China is actually quite the same is less romantic sounding but perhaps more more realistic but the other part of your question Sushant is you know in a sense how genuine is this I mean, it's always a very tricky question to ask and even if one asks that just because something is genuinely held as a view doesn't necessarily mean that we're necessarily comfortable with it lots of people who hold extremist political views around the world are very genuine in what they think i don't think they're you know being cynical but i don't necessarily think i want to spend too much time uh, in in the company of their world views so i think there is a genuine sense in china based on their own let's say, century and a half, most recently, of history, that China is vulnerable to the outside world for a variety of reasons. Number one is, of course, it has many, many borders. I mean, India knows something about this, but compare, I think, 14 international land borders is what China has at the last, um, last glance, as well as, of course, huge maritime exposure. And also, of course, things we may come on to talk more about this, such as a feeling, logical or not, that certain important supply routes to China, including Straits of Malacca being a classic maritime example, are things where China could be cut off at a pinch point. So in terms of is there a desire to build up a nationalistic mindset that fuels this idea, which is being deliberately pushed by propaganda, sure. Is there also a set of geopolitical realities that means that China is different from the US, which has two massive oceans on either side to uh, to keep it separated? That's also true. Uh, Rana, coming back to something which you covered in your last book, you know, uh, the, the reimagination of Second World War in China over a certain period of time. Now, I wanted to ask you, has this reimagination of Second World War seen India figure in those conversations in any way? And even beyond uh, beyond that, where does India figure in the Chinese con- Chinese historical nar- narrative of the 20th century? Uh, or is it what many Indians fear that China does not care for India at all? So several parts to that question. Let me try and take them one by one, because each has, I think, a really quite interesting answer. In terms of the Second World War experience, you may be surprised, maybe not. No, the answer is yes. Actually, China has become, in recent years, much more interested, but through a slightly sideways narrative. Let, let me explain. It may or may not be well known, but actually India was rather significant in various aspects to China's World War II experience. Now, you know, India had its own liberation struggle, as we know, during the 30s and 40s. But in terms of direct attack during World War II, it was relatively more shielded. Although I should say that, you know, my, my father, who, you know, um, grew up in uh, uh, Kolkata in the 40s, 30s and 40s, still you know, has, I think, some memory of the, the kind of air raids and so forth that did happen on a sporadic basis uh, over the city. So India wasn't completely spared. But compared to China, which was repeatedly firebombed by the Japanese on a sort of yearly basis where, you know, the invasion created the destruction of huge amounts of um, property and the destructions of millions of lives, the two aren't comparable. However, There was a very important use for British India, as it then was, in terms of a training ground for some of the crack troops that were actually Chinese troops that were kept as what became known as the X-Force, that were trained by a variety of officers, British, Indian, uh, and indeed Chinese too, um, to be sent in for the second Burma campaign in 1944. Now, largely because of the bad relations between China and India that you and I, I think, will we'll talk about in just a few minutes. But because of that, that history wasn't very well remembered, frankly, either in India or in China, but certainly in China during most of the Cold War and post-Cold War period. But recently, and this is one of the topics of my book, China's Good War, which I'm delighted to say actually is available in a special Indian edition. I hope people if that time and inclination, they should uh, be, feel free to, to check it out, um, is a revival of interest in the communists' old opponents, the nationalists, the Kuomintang under Chiang Kai-shek, who actually were running China during World War II. And those Chinese nationalists were, very, were a very important part of the thrust back to recapture Burma from the Japanese in 1944. And of course, many of the troops, the ex forks troops, came in from British India through the jungles of Burma to fight in that in that war. Now, the Chinese contribution, along with the Indian contribution, isn't nearly as well remembered in Western memory of the Burma campaign as it should be. But nonetheless, in China, there has been a revival of interest. And I'm thinking of actually my own visit a few years ago to the sort of Burma um, China border area, where some of the really fiercely fought battles of that era, uh, which were fought by the Chinese expeditionary forces, but in tandem with the British and British Indian expeditionary forces, have now got their own museums, 
Uh, they have uh, books, there are TV shows, online social media and so forth that do recall that period. I wouldn't say it's the dominant memory of that period, but it's now very much part of the historical conversation in a way that simply wasn't true 25 years ago. So things have changed. More, more broadly speaking, um, this sort of sense in which um, the experience of uh, conflict and invasion and wartime has been part of the shaping of um, uh, of the Chinese uh, perception of uh, of India is one part of a longer story. I don't think it's true that China simply doesn't care about India, although I think it is fair to say that until quite recently, India tended to be regarded in a slightly, you know, sort of second tier way. You know, it's an important country, you know, relations with India are important to us. But in the end, you know, the trading relationship isn't that big. The military relationship is mostly these kind of, you know, clashes on the border that never seem to add up to very much until 2020. Um, and of course, as uh, you know, many will be aware, while in India, the legacy of the 1962 border war is still very keenly felt and mourned, it's really until recently hasn't been talked about very much in China at all. A country which went through the Cultural Revolution, which, you know, millions of people suffered, the Great Leap Forward famine in which tens of millions died, in that context, a small border war with only a few hundred deaths or thousand deaths is not really something that fits into that historical narrative. So India until recently has been important, but I think probably it's fair to say secondary, not, not you know, kind of at the bottom of the pile, but not quite in the top tier of relationships compared to Russia, America, or even parts of Europe. Rana, is it because of the, the big geographical feature of Himalayas, which actually separated to the two, two countries, despite being neighbors? You know, if you look at a two-dimensional map, they look like neighbors. But once you look at a three-dimensional, Himalayas were a formidable uh, barrier between the two countries. And also because the intermediation with China was being done through a colonial power through Britain, whether in Hong Kong or whether the, the Indian cops, cops which were deployed in Shanghai. Uh, is is that the reason why there was no no interaction with India or no interest in India, even even after the Chinese Communist Party took over? Well, actually, in terms of elites, there was perhaps more interest than that that indicates. And you're right that the Himalayas, of course, are you know, a massive physical barrier, but in some ways they provided a point of connection. And of course, famously during World War II, pilots flew the famous Burma hump across the Himalayas from uh, British India into China to provide supplies. But in terms of the way in which Chinese leaders and Indian leaders thought about each other in the mid 20th century, actually, the relationship is more deep and more complex. And let's take a figure like Nehru. Nehru, uh, of course, had many pan-Asian connections during the years that he was fighting for India's liberation. And amongst them was Chiang Kai-shek, the Chinese nationalist leader who came to, you know, slightly um, what we're calling sort of slightly unstable, but nonetheless real power in the late 1920s and remained in charge on the mainland through the war against Japan until finally being kicked off the mainland by Mao Zedong, Chairman Mao. Now, Nehru's relationship with Chiang Kai-shek was very much those of two Asian liberation leaders who talked to each other on that basis. Uh, Chiang Kai-shek was, of course, in charge of China, which was a country that was largely but not completely sovereign, whereas India, of course, was a full colony. But nonetheless, they both had imperial Western powers and the Japanese, of course, in the case of, of China, on their soil. And that gave them certain points of, of, of commonality. However, there is a particular incident in World War II that I think in some ways illustrates the gap between the two sides. In February 1942, very early on in the Allied war, you know, after Pearl Harbor, Chiang Kai-shek, against the wishes of Winston Churchill, the British Prime Minister, flew to um, Calcutta and basically met both Gandhi and Nehru at that time. His aim was one that actually, I mean, Churchill shouldn't have criticized him because his aim was one that Churchill should have supported, which was try and persuade Congress into full wholeheartedly joining the British war effort. And Nehru and Gandhi made it clear for their own reason, this is the year that quit India was going to happen later on. They weren't going to be doing that. So actually, Chiang Kai-shek in his diary wrote afterwards that he felt that he hadn't really quite connected. He connected well with Nehru, not so much with Gandhi. Other figures like, um, uh, you know, of, of the Congress party, he'd also had, I think, a decent relationship with. But in the end, there was a difference of view as well. So the fact that they felt a certain sort of friendship because of their shared anti-imperial ideas didn't necessarily mean that they all shared the same policy. Now, when Mao won power in China after 1949, Nehru was very keen to keep the relationship with going. I think he you know, regretted the loss of connections with Chiang Kai-shek, but you know, he admired Mao and wanted to have that relationship with him. And for a while, Mao and the communists were also keen to find other 
uh, connections that would enable this newly emergent China in the communist bloc, no relations with the US, you know, making its way to make new friendships. And there's a wonderful book called uh, Making It Count by Ornab Ghosh, who's um, professor of Chinese history at um, Harvard. You recorded the first episode of the podcast with him, with Arunav. Fantastic. So you've spoken to Arunav. So you know his book is basically about the relationship in terms of science and statistics between India and China during those early Nehru Mao years. And then, of course, 1962 and the confrontation over the border essentially shatters that relationship. But the earlier period shows that the Himalayas, of course, are an important barrier, but they were not an insurmountable one if the meeting of minds and ideas had been closer than they were. Uh, you spoke of the 1962 war, and clearly on the Indian side, it weighs very heavily when it looks at China. But how does China look at the 1962 border conflict, particularly, and I ask this for a very specific reason, because of a new PLA-approved history of the 1962 border conflict, you know, titled 100 Questions on the China-India Border Self-Defense Counterattack, that came out last month. You know, extracts of the books book were published. Uh, in the popular Chinese website, Guangxia, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. So does it, does, uh, how does China look at the border conflict now? Well, Guangxia is a website I know quite well. It's run by Eric Li, who's a very sort of, you know, prominent spokesperson for, you know, Chinese ideas in the, in the world. And, um, you know, some of my own essays have appeared actually in translation on that website too. Uh, people have agreed and disagreed with various aspects, but always part of a good, good, good debate. But I think, you know, it's clear that Guangxia certainly is a website that likes to put forward, how can you put it, quite a uh, robust view of China's place in the, uh, in the world. So look, I think it's absolutely fair to say that for most of the past 60 years, 1962 to 2022, the India-China war has not been a major subject of discussion or interest compared to some of the other wars, the Korean War or you know, the, uh, um, uh, the Second World Vietnam, War. Vietnam, Vietnam. Uh, the Vietnam. Well, the Vietnam, the China-Vietnam War in 1979, has been a great interest, but most discussion has been suppressed because, of course, China didn't win that war. You know, at the very best, you could say it was a draw between two, both sides, um, and therefore discussion of it has been in some ways quite restricted. The Korean War, China regards itself essentially as having you know, won enough to be able to discuss it quite quite broadly. But the India War, although China views itself as having won, um, wasn't really in service of a wide political aim at that stage, and therefore you know, remain more the subject of specialists. It's been discussed in the academy, but not very popularly. I think that there is almost, I couldn't swear to it, but I would say there's almost certainly a link between the growing tensions and confrontations in the present day on the India-China border, so uh, Galwan and so forth, and the desire to pull out a historical justification that is behind this particular um, uh, book, The Hundred Questions, uh, that's been put forward. I have to confess, I only read summaries of it. I haven't actually had a chance to read the book itself, so one has to see in detail what it says. But certainly it does suggest that Something which for a long time China had been willing to put on the back burner, you know, this continuing, the Chinese phrase mortar, um, friction with India on the border, seems to have been turned off, if not to a full flame, at least to something a little, you know, hotter in terms of that, uh, that relationship. And this actually, in, in a sense, is part of a, a slightly surprising move that Chinese diplomacy, broadly defined, has been doing over the last two or three years. Previously, China was really quite careful to make sure it only had one big potential confrontation on its borders at one time. So at a time when North Korea was playing up, you find relations with Japan were quite calm. When they wanted to really push back against the Japanese, then they'd be quite nice to India. But in the last few years, actually China's um, diplomacy has been pushed much more towards trying to push many of the buttons at the same time and see what happens. So the fact that there's this you know, more confrontational language with India, at the same time, the relationship with America is still very fraught. And of course, a continuing of um, uh, um, uh, pressure in the Pacific region, including, of course, in particular on the South China Sea, um, has suggested that there is a sort of shift in China's um, robust diplomatic language, quite confrontational diplomatic language, in which India is one part but can't be seen simply on its own. It has to be seen as part of a, a kind of wider matrix. But Rana, is it uh, this change in uh, taking on many adversaries at the same time or many areas of interest at the same time? Uh, is it due to Xi's personality, President Xi's personality? It, what, what is it that is driving this? Or is it uh, nationalism, ethno-nationalism that is playing out, uh, which many people blame for what's going on with India on the border for the last 21 months in Ladakh? Because India and China seem to have moved from a path of competition to confrontation to almost conflict now. 
So what what which what parts are playing a major role? Nationalism, ethno nationalism, Xi's personality, the U.S. role, PLA's own importance, you know, territorial desires of of the Chinese Communist Party. What is it that is playing an important part here? My own belief with any major political shift or movement is that you can't separate personalities from structural shifts, and both of them are important here. Yes, Xi Jinping is important. You know, I think it is very clear. There's no doubt that compared to his predecessor Hu Jintao, he has a much more active idea of how China will engage with the world. But you have to also consider how he got to that position, and that's partly because from the late 2000s. In fact, I'll date it more precisely. In my view, a really important turning point was the 2008 global financial crisis, because that was the moment at which China's elites, as well as the wider population, but certainly the elites, began to think maybe this Washington. Defined economic and political system doesn't work so well, and we don't have to spend our time working out how we're going to fit into it. We have our own thing to do, and maybe that'll work better. Now, that was four years before Xi Jinping came to power, although he had been、uh, designated as the next leader. But the leaders of that time, Hu Jintao and even more Prime Minister Wen Jiabao, both of whom stepped down in 2012, were beginning to use this language to the wider world of "Look, China's going to find its own path, and we don't necessarily have to fit into what the rest of you, particularly the West." Um, have to、uh, have to say. So the question of why China's got onto that path, I think, has something to do with Xi Jinping's personality. He's very comfortable in his own skin. That's a、um, phrase I've heard from more than one other kind of Western leader who's, who's met him. He's not a guy who feels nervous or in any way lacks confidence about the path that he's taking. You know, this quite confrontational path with the with the Western world, at least in terms of, of rhetoric. But also beyond that, there are structural factors that really. You know, have shifted things. China has become the second biggest economy in the world. It may or may not, but it may become the biggest in the world at some point, which will certainly give a big confidence boost. It's also, of course, embedded into the world economy in a way that means that even now, when countries, including India, are trying to find ways to decouple from aspects of China's global presence, it's really, really hard, and that gives them an awful lot of confidence. Now, that would be true. Even if someone other than Xi Jinping were president, but the fact that he is president and general secretary and his personality is very keen on making sure that China pushes its advantages, economic, military, cultural, with a strong and unapologetic view about China's right to have a place in the world, operates at the same time as these wider economic currents that suggest that, for instance, in areas like technology, many other、um, actors. Find it difficult to find alternative ways to go compared to uh, uh, to taking on Chinese、uh, technology and know-how. India, of course, for various reasons, decided, particularly post Galwan, to try and go in that direction. And of course, there are indigenous Indian、um, tech producers that are part of that process. But India's experience shows that actually it's not easy to substitute Chinese、um, technology, both hardware and software, and know-how if you want to do it. It can be done. And in some cases, countries feel they have to do it. But it shows that China has reason structurally for the confidence that it feels in terms of its leadership being able to go out in the world and say, "We want this, we don't want that," and that's the way it's going to be. Prana, are there any specific factors pertaining to India which may not pertain to West when it comes to this、uh, conflict, confrontation, whatever, what, whatever you may call, classify it as that we are seeing now? You know, there's almost fifty、uh, hundred, fifty thousand troops from each side in Ladakh, additionally deployed in you know really horrible climate. You know, it's it, 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 it's it's I just don't figure it out for twenty one months. What's going on? I mean, the most obvious. Difference is one of the things that you've actually just mentioned, Shrihant, which is、um, the fact that this is for both India and China a war with the neighbours potentially. You know, hopefully it doesn't come to a conflict, but you know the physicality of troops on both sides is something. You know, obviously the United States is in a confrontation in the broader sense with China, but even now and even in the age, obviously of hypersonic missiles and all the things that the Chinese are beginning to bring out, nonetheless there is a geographical separation that does make the conversation significantly different. Even with Japan, which perhaps is the Asian power that has the most to lose from the rise of of China, the separation physically of the two sides is important in that、uh, in that. Sense there are maritime disputes, but they are slightly different in nature, significantly actually, from、uh, the question of of, of land、um, land borders. I think also there is something that is probably、um, distinctive at the moment to the Indian situation.、Uh, in a sense, it's a version of the Chinese problem. It's this: how is this? How are these two very large, populous, and you know globally significant countries positioning? Their own、uh, positions in Asia to the outside world. Now, 
I'm going to kind of caricature for a, while, for, for a moment, but for a long time, China, India's foreign policy was almost not to have a foreign policy, except on some specific questions like Pakistan. But, you know, in terms of having to deal with the neighbors, having to deal with China, it was a kind of strategy of management because Indian politics, as we all know, is so kind of lively and all consuming and exciting that most Indian politicians get to you know, power by promising things domestically. They always talk about India shining and, you know, global India, whatever, but it's not something that people spend that much time either thinking or frankly voting about. Now, the question now comes at this point, and they're trying to work this out in Beijing as well, is that shifting? Do issues such as the quad arrangement, you know, as you know very well, uh, India, uh, Japan, Australia, and the United States coming together in quadrilateral military shared exercises and, and command, do um, the um, does the increasing uh, navalization of the Indian Ocean space and you know the question of affiliations of Middle Eastern countries and island countries pro uh, prove that actually India is changing and is deciding to have to have a proactive foreign policy or is the growing sense that actually this can become part of a new way in which China gets to define a previously relatively ungoverned space in Chinese terms? That is something that I think is different from the other major actors, because the if you're talking about in oceanic terms, you're talking about differences between India and, and other actors. The Atlantic, for the moment, remains an American lake. There's a Russian presence, there's even the Chinese presence, I suspect, now and then. But really, you know, this is still about the United States and its allies. The Pacific is already divided. We know that America's allies and China are, you know, trying to find ways to make their military and security stories and their trade stories in the region come together. And India is, a, in a small way, part of that as well. But the Indian Ocean space is still much, much more for grabs in, in various ways. And the question of what India is going to do about that is as much interest in Beijing as the question of how Beijing feels about it should be and is of interest in New Delhi. You're right, Rana, because one of the Chinese and less famous line, Indian Ocean is not India's ocean. Uh, that, that, that always uh, that always you know, uh, sounds very ominous in 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 Delhi or in India wherever, wherever you are. Uh, uh, Rana, that leads me to the obvious question: How can India then counter China? China's power. What can what can India really do? You at one point in time you advocated the Shanghai Cooperation Organization as an answer. Can, it could be modeled on the ASEAN. You said uh, you know Indians seem to be now keen on Quad, which you just referred to. Uh, and then we have the recent uh, you know Putin Xi Bonhomi and this long statement which has come out between the two after the two meeting the two leaders that's bound to make India uncomfortable. Virtually forcing it to cho choose sides in what some are calling as the new Cold War. What are India's best options in this case? Well, Shashank, it depends a bit what the end goal of India's um, strategy is supposed to be. Um, I mean, I'm assuming that unlike you know, many other countries, India is not seeking to expand its territory or it's not seeking to create some sort of you know, newly reordered world. It, I mean, my, my guess is that most Indian elites, regardless of which political party they come from, would rather like a relatively quiet world or a quiet Asia in which India gets on with Indian things and um, the rest of the world kind of leaves it alone. I mean, you know, India is never even you know, in the days of Nehru, wanted to be more than a rhetorical actor as opposed to a military actor in the wider world. So the question of pushing back against China depends you know, in what context. Um, in terms of trying to make India as economically self-sufficient as possible, we know some of the answers might be uncomfortable because, of course, India has a very long tradition of trying to you know, keep its trade barriers as um, restricted as possible compared to other societies. You know, I have an Indian background and grew up coming to Kolkata in the you know, 1980s, 1990s, and still have fond memories of everything from load shedding to, um, you know, substituted goods, you know, Campacola, Thumbs Up, you know, all these products, because Coca-Cola wasn't, wasn't permitted. Um, you know, these are things that are difficult to make. I know that things have changed since then, obviously, in the last 20, 30 years. But nonetheless, most people working in international trade will say that doing a deal with China on trade is hard and tough. Doing it with India is pretty much impossible. You know, India has not signed any major trade agreements in, in recent decades, and at the moment seems unlikely to do so. The problem is that the kind of like-minded countries who believe in the international trade system, who broadly still stick to democratic uh, structures, even if India has become much more populist recently, it still remains a structural democracy. These are things that are difficult to pick and choose from to some extent. I don't think there's any argument, nor would anyone want one, that India should throw open its doors to every single, you know, kind of Western character who comes along wanting to open up the, the market. But at the same time, it's difficult to maintain an argument that China 
as one of the world's major supply chain operators and trading powers um, can in some way be pushed back against by an alternative international trading system if you're not fully willing to be part of that system, which includes, of course, a reform and change within the system, not simply accepting as it is. But right now, you know, that conversation is one that is still quite active. So, you know, there are plenty of other examples, but I think part of my, my, my overall answer to you, um, Shushant, is in how many areas does India feel that it's willing to get uncomfortable about some of the things that it might have to do to create new sorts of alliances and partnerships that would enable it to uh, reshape the Asia space? Well, Rana, that's a very great point about trade because India pulled out of the RECP after almost a decade of negotiation. Uh, and even otherwise, it has turned more and more autarkic in its nature in the name of self-reliance. And that's something, you know, a lot of policies have been reversed, uh, FTAs have been cancelled, etc. So, and as the as London knows better than us, signing a deal with India is al- almost impossible, even after you guys have pulled out of the EU. So that, that that's that's absolutely that's absolutely true. Uh, something which you which you hinted at, Rana, but I wanted to explore that. You know, India's strength is a liberal democracy, you know, which valued pluralism, peaceful engagement, democratic values, etc., dissent, etc. They have gone down dramatically in the last few years since Mr. Modi became the prime minister. You know, as India really does not have the economic and military wherewithal to take on China, how is this loss of, you know, what would classify as soft power and, and values now playing out for India? It's really very important indeed, particularly if part of the narrative about China is going to be that there are democracies, that essentially have a different way of ordering society that can stand up to China's economically so far highly successful authoritarian model. And as someone myself who thinks that, you know, the ability to maintain liberal freedoms is a very important part of a democratic state, I would say that that's very, very important. I've you know written frequently and indeed will continue to write, I've got more things coming out, making a case that one of the greatest um, you know, sort of uh, obstacles in terms of the liberal world, more broadly speaking, being able to push back against China's argument that it's, you know, technocracy or meritocracy, as they would call it, um, work just works better than democracy when it comes to anything from COVID prevention to, um, you know, economic uh, actualization of, of opportunities, is to show that actually liberal democracies believe in their own values. And the ability, you know, even now, of, I mean, I know that the day we're speaking, we don't know the results, but there's a big regional election going on in Uttar Pradesh. And the ability that we've seen over the decades for India's voters to, you know, throw out governments and change the people who rule them does remain an important part of the reason why I think, you know, even up to, to this point, India has not had a revolution. It's not had the kind of, you know, overall overturning of the system that, of course, we saw in China in uh, many points uh, in the last 70 uh, to 75 uh, years. But it also needs the rest of us. You know, the United States cannot keep electing politicians who don't accept the validity of the electoral results. The United Kingdom, you know, the country that I'm sitting in now, needs to make sure that it values the institutions of um, the, the wider liberal media sphere. You know, I sometimes say, and I'll say it here again, that it sometimes appears that the only two political parties in the world that want to shut down the BBC, one of them is the Chinese Communist Party, the other one is the British Conservative Party. Now, that is slightly unfair to many you know, good conservatives who I'm sure are you know, proud of the fact that the BBC is well respected. But if you're working in British media, it often feels that actually you're fighting against your own government rather than being part of what it should be, which is a strong liberal front which embraces different viewpoints and willingness to ask tough questions to authority, because that's the one thing that the Chinese system absolutely doesn't have. To its credit, for the most part, there is still something of that left in India, even though the press has obviously become more constrained in recent years as well. And pushing back in the other direction and having governments that get annoyed by criticism on a day-to-day basis, but understand more broadly that's part of what makes the system great, we need to get back in that direction. Yeah, tell us in India about it. I, now, I was a journalist for six years. <laughs> you know, tell, 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 you know, we, we can probably talk about it much more. Uh, but uh, but the point which you which you refer to about about China's and, and the Chinese model, you know, in India, almost China's economic success and its rise as a global power, the shiny infrastructure when you go to Beijing or Shanghai or wherever, the high rate of growth, it has created almost a sense of China and we in India. You know, and I'm not talking that there's alarm and anger at what the Chinese are doing on the border, but there's almost a sense of China envy that you that you see more and more in India. The secret of its success, you know, in a much simplified manner, a much simplistic manner, is seen as its character as a very centralized authoritarian state directly and totally controlling everything, the Chinese Communist Party controlling everything very, very closely. 
Is that a fair understanding of contemporary China and the reasons of its success? So I've got good news for those who've got China envy of that sort. I would say that what you've just said is almost exactly the wrong way to think about why China has been so successful economically. One of the things that makes China's model so unique is that it represses political freedoms very, very strongly in all sorts of areas, you know, no advocacy of multi-party democracy being an obvious example. But it actually provides huge amounts of economic freedom. And one of the things that the government simply doesn't, you know, control from the top down, even though sometimes it wants to, is the ability of people to undertake massively varied economic experiments across the country. So, you know, Guangdong province down on the south coast, from the days of Deng Xiaoping onward, became a sort of test zone for trying out everything from marketization to the ability to actually bring in foreign investment and use it to kind of grow the economy. Very different from experiments that were tried, you know, say, in southwest China around Chongqing, where a much more state-driven idea of kind of, you know, directing of, uh, of investment um, was, and also a much more strongly welfareist system, was actually tried out to see if that might work better. You know, China is a huge conglomeration of different economic experiments, some of which have been successful and some of which haven't. But it's the system's unwillingness after the disaster of the Cultural Revolution, when everything really was centralized, um, the unwillingness of the system even now to make everything fit under just one economic roof that I think is important. What that says to me, and I would say this, I'm going to say it very openly, is that I think that suggests that there's no reason that China couldn't do that politically as well. The ability to open up its politics far more than it's done in recent years is not in any way a counter argument to the economic success. Now, there have been times when China has actually been much more willing to talk openly. The early 19, sorry, the early 1980s and the late 1990s to early 2000s were actually times, you know, obviously it was still a one-party authoritarian state, but social media was much freer. There was much more discussion even of conceptual ideas like democracy and constitutionalism. Really in the last seven to eight years, that's been shut down in, in, in for the most part by official decree. But it's a sign that even within a one-party system, there was space for more political liberalism than there had been before. And the system not only didn't fall apart, it actually did perfectly well at that time. And that didn't in any way impede the economic experiments, which in which actually anti-centralization has been a really important part of what's made it succeed. And Rana, before we finish, finally, uh, can you suggest three books about modern China that you would recommend to those interested in understanding the country better? So many choices, and I will make sure I don't mention any by myself, because I don't think that would be quite the right thing to do. But in terms of um, a sweeping but very readable history of the 20th century, it was actually the first book that I ever read on Chinese history. And the author died just a few weeks ago, in fact, the great American historian Jonathan D. Spence. And his book, The Gate of Heavenly Peace, The Chinese and Their Revolution, goes all the way from the late 19th century to the late 20th century. And it's a superb panoramic view, you know, beautifully written, very moving. In terms of trying to understand China, today, um, you know, there is a plethora of wonderful books by wonderful experts, but just because we're speaking, you know, in February 2022, I'll mention one of the most recently published by the fantastic Elizabeth Economy, um, fellow at Stanford, long time on the China, the Council of Foreign Relations, and the book is just called The World According to China, and it's a really good sort of one-stop shop, beautifully written again, in terms of trying to understand some of the geopolitical concerns of China itself. And then the final thing I'd, um, I, I'd add in that mixture is that you need to understand something about kind of, you know, the mind and the intellect of, of China. And I think one of the best ways if people haven't read it is to read the best selling Chinese science fiction novel that's also gone global. And that's The Three Body Problem by Liu Cixin, uh, available easily in English translation. One of the few, but I'm sure growing number of Chinese science fiction novels that's really had a big take off around the world. Uh, and that is a very different viewpoint on what China's about compared to a book of political economy or even history. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Rana. This was really enlightening and very interesting. Well, thank you so much, Shad. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you. And thanks for some great questions. And I um, hope that uh, things continue to thrive with, with the podcast. Uh, thank you so much. And to our listeners, thank you for listening. For more information on our work, follow us on Twitter at CPR underscore India and log on to our website, www.cprindia.org.